and showing their need for righteousness which comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said of them, because that knowing God, they had not glorified Him as God, neither gave thanks, but became vain in their reasonings or their imaginations. And their senseless heart was darkened. Romans 1.21 Later, in describing the grievous times, if you please, of what he calls the last days, he declared, For men shall be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, haughty, railers, disobedient to parents. And he says it again, unthankful and unholy, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2. Well, this morning I would like to talk to you about the sin of ingratitude. And in so doing, as we've introduced it, I want us to look at an incident in the life of Christ. Uh, the record of which is found in Luke 17, 11 through 19. And I think that you will see this gives us a glaring example of the sin of ingratitude. It has to do with the ten lepers. And the account is of a time that took place as Jesus and his disciples passed along the border of Samaria and Galilee. And as the narrative unfolds, Jesus and his company in some village that is unnamed, are confronted with ten lepers. Now, observe what this dreaded disease had done for these men. It had brought them to a common level, causing them to be unmindful of formerly held racial hatred and prejudices. The fact that one of them was a Samaritan implies that others were Jews and Jews customarily have no dealings with the Samaritans, so recorded in John 4 and verse 9. But here that custom is ignored as the dreaded disease of leprosy puts all ten of these men on a common level. Sin the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. The dreaded disease of the soul likewise reduces all men to a common lot before God. Notice that it had made them unclean. Now the law of Moses had in it the law of the lepers, how to deal with them. And they must stand far off and cry aloud and warn any approaching person of his uncleanness. Leviticus 13, verse 45. Similarly, sin makes all men unclean in the eyes of God. And until, if you please, this leprosy of the soul is washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ, then man remains unclean. Notice too that this leprosy had isolated them from the best of society. The individual with leprosy had to dwell apart from the rest of society, had to dwell alone, or as was the case here in a colony of lepers. Leviticus 13, verse 46. Now that's why these particular men stood afar off. And in a similar fashion, sin isolates men from God. And the best and the purest of society, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Notice that these men 
because of their leprosy, because of the things we've noted about them, were filled with despair. I don't know how many of us may have ever been driven to a state of despair. It is, of course, a mental condition reflected in our emotions. For leprosy, there was no known human remedy. And comparing it to the sin of the soul or the leprosy of the soul, and, you know, there's no known human remedy. So it's out of this despair that these ten lepers, for what else can they do, cry out to Jesus for mercy. I think we see that it was a sincere, very earnest cry. The scripture says they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in calling men back to Christ and getting men to see that it's only through Christ that salvation is possible, that men would be brought to this kind of state so that they would cry out, have mercy on us, and appeal to Jesus as his word directs to find that mercy. The people of the day of Pentecost, when they were convicted by the truth preached to them, were pricked in their heart. And they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I pause here to simply say that we in the church who are charged, and it is indeed a privilege too, to preach the gospel to every creature, for that gospel is God's power to save men, Romans 1.16. We must realize that people must come to grips with the sin in their life and the enormity and heinousness of sin to where they despair. What are we going to do? As Peter's faith waned in walking on the water and he began to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. Until we can bring people to that state of mind, that attitude and disposition of the heart, nothing else is going to help them. You can teach them the plan of salvation. You can show them about the New Testament church and its work, its organization, and its worship. But until they can be brought to this stage, to where they can't help themselves, they know nobody else can help themselves. If they die, they know there is nothing but an eternal devil's hell waiting on them. All because of sin of which they're guilty then, of course, there's nothing much we can do but keep on living right, teaching right, and contending for the faith. This cry was universal. All of the afflicted asked for mercy. And this reminds us, this reminds us of the affliction that comes from our sins. And we need to remember, I don't know how many times that's going to go, but we're going to get through the sermon pretty quick if it keeps on. We need to remember that affliction often causes one to turn to the Lord. I would remind you that David declared, and I don't think we look at affliction this way, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. I want to ask you a question. When's the last time you said that? And really meant it. Notice what he says in conclusion. That I may learn thy statutes. Psalm 119, 71. There's nothing that this material world has to offer that's abiding. The Bible continually tells you that the devil is in control of this present world. It's his instrument to use to get us to sin against God and to remain unrepentant. But these receive mercy. Jesus told them to comply with the law regarding the cleansing of lepers because they're Jews and they're still under the law. And this Samaritan, of course, would abide by this part of the law, Leviticus 13, 47 through 58. 
And notice that as they went, they were cleansed. I hope it was faster than this work. Notice that they were not cleansed before obeying what the Lord commanded them to do. I think it's an important point everybody needs to understand. You may not see it in the particular matter. But it's when they had faith enough to cause them to act upon what he told them to do. As they went, as their mind was set upon doing what the law said, then they were cleansed of that leprosy. Now we come to one of the main points that I want to make. If y'all knew just how slow this slows me up. I could preach 40 sermons in this length of time. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice glorifying God. And he fell upon his face. He was at Jesus' feet. He was, in effect, engaging in an act of worship, giving him thanks. And then it says he was a Samaritan, verses 15 and 16. That's significant. We usually remember the Good Samaritan. The man, remember, was left for dead on his way down to Jericho, beaten and robbed and naked. The priest went by, and the Levi went by, and neither one had time for him. They went all the way on the other side of the road. But it was the Samaritan then who was looked upon as a dog. The Jews would not even travel through their country. If a Jew went from Jerusalem to Galilee, he went over to the east of Jordan, traveled up north, and then when he got across from Galilee, then he went back over to Galilee because he would not go up through Samaria. I don't know that any of us understand the disposition of mind of the average Jew toward the Samaritan. But here you see that the Samaritan shows appreciation. And where were the Jews? So this was a, a grateful blessing. The voice of entreaty now becomes the voice of thanksgiving. And with a loud voice, you remember he had asked for mercy. With a loud voice, he now thanks Christ for the mercy received. All too often, we are a people who don't have a lot of time for God. Let me give you an example, all these Christians that live every day just like Christ and are gathered in this auditorium. How many of you studied your Bible lesson for this morning since you closed your Bible last Sunday morning? Meditated on the Word and tried to figure out those things. Or do you study it and open your Bible on Sunday morning, then you close it, and then you open it again next Sunday morning. But we're going to pray like we know that book, like it programs our minds daily, and that all we're interested in is knowing the book, putting it into practice. And we're real quick to say, please remember so-and-so in prayer. Please remember me in prayer when we haven't really remembered God very much, have we? But we'll pray, oh, help so-and-so to be healed. Beg for God to heal us when things don't go well. But if things go better, how many of us are as exultant as this Samaritan was when he knew he was healed and was thankful for it? This attitude of gratitude is all the more remarkable then and we emphasize it when here is one a Jew would have nothing to do with. And this is a, 
I think a very stri striking reminder that virtue is often found. Now get this. Virtue is often found among those in whom it is least expected. So many times we are blessed in all sorts of ways. Why to be born in America is to be blessed greatly. But folks who don't have much at all, not even what the poorest in America have, sometimes it takes that before we know even that there is such a word as thank you and appreciation. As a result of this man's gratitude for his requested blessing, he received then further blessing, one he had not expected. His body had been cleansed from its disease, but according to verse 19, his faith had made him, there's that little word, W-H-O-L-E, whole. Now the footnote in the American Standard Version, 1901, says, made thee whole, saved thee. This shows that gratitude for one blessing, notice this, gratitude for one blessing provided for you prepares one for other, even greater blessings. But now that's the one. What about the nine? Jesus answered and said, Were not the ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there none found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger? Stranger to what? Verses 17 and 18. Stranger to the covenants of the law and the promises, for he was not a Jew. That's what it means in the Old Testament. It costs about strange anything while the law was in effect. It means strange to the law. Think how disappointed Jesus must have been with the nine. I, I don't think sometimes we think about Jesus as much human as you are. He was impacted in the same way we are. Have you ever done a good thing for somebody? You did it out of the goodness of your heart. But there was little appreciation, if any, expressed. Think how sad it is. Where are the nine? He's disappointed, folks. Disappointed with the ingratitude of mankind. And yet over as we read in Romans 1, one of the signs of departure from God is they become unthankful. Look around you. In the life that we're living in this nation. The nine provide us with a glaring example of the sin of ingratitude. They were nearer their healer in their illness than in their health. They prayed when in distress but remained silent when thanks ought to have been given. Are we like that? Let me ask you this. Over, we won't talk about the first part of this year. Let's just talk about 2017. Were you more critical and complaining about things in 2017? Or were you more thankful and appreciative? And you expressed it to people. And let me ask you this. When's the last time you said thank you? When's the last time you said I appreciate that? Notice that we're reminding. And it's the Bible that reminds us that in everything by prayer and supplication, what is that next part? With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. Now, there's nothing wrong to ask God for things. 
We should have the attitude, since he knows better for us than we know for ourselves, not my will but thine be done. There's not a thing in the world wrong with asking God for things and the right motive, right attitude. We forget sometimes that in our petitions to the Father, we ought to have Colossians 3.17 behind that too. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And prayer is one of those things. So we need to model prayer. We need to model our prayers after the inspired model prayer. But there's nothing wrong with asking God for things. But what about thanking him for the things we already have and what we, what we get? proper to entreat God for blessing. But help us not to be forgetful to thank Him for blessings received. When is the last time you thank God for just this one thing? Being born in America. Observe that these men obviously were, were Jews, as I said earlier, the nine. Only the one who returned to give thanks is said to be a stranger. Literally, again, I say that means an alien. The nine were privileged men. Men from whom more would be rightfully expected. But their ingratitude, therefore, is all the more conspicuous and is a reminder that less virtue is often found where it's most expected. Well, as a consequence of their ingratitude, then the blessings of the nine were limited. As far as we know, they received only a physical blessing. Language means anything. One reason many people receive so few benefits is because they're ungrateful for what they do receive. So what are some of the vital lessons to be learned? There are three of them. And we should learn them. I'll substitute the word ought for should. From the ten we should learn that all need cleansing from the leprosy of sin. Romans 3.23, for all the sin and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. Number two, from the nine, we should learn that ingratitude is one of the ugliest sins of which one may be guilty. Now, pause here, folks, and think with me. Let's make this practical. What are you teaching your children? Give me, give me, give me. But rarely, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I appreciate what I have. Then point three, from the one, we should learn the duty and the beauty of gratitude. Now it's rather interesting to me that uh, words like thank you and ingratitude are, are so small. We understand them intellectually very easy. But put them into practice daily. And those little words get to be very big. When the great British writer Rudyard Kipling was at his peak in writing. He was said to have been paid more about anybody as a literary man. And there were a few students, I don't know whether it's two or three, at one of the schools in England, Oxford, Cambridge, someplace like that. And I forgot how much, but it would be quite a few dollars and adjusting from pounds to dollars that it had been calculated he was being paid for each word. And so they thought they would be smart alecks as people sometimes are very good at being. And they wrote him and asked if he would give them a couple of his best words. A little while passed, here came the letter. And it was addressed to them, and it said, thank you, because they had sent him the amount of money that it was said he got for each word he wrote. 
Those still are two of the best words you're going to find. <laughs> Thank you. You realize how many times in the area of manners when it was actually taught in a curriculum of years ago and what would be called finishing schools and nobody knows hardly that there was such a thing nowadays that people were taught to say please and thank you and younger people to older people yes sir and no sir and yes ma'am and no ma'am doesn't exist too much in our society today any more than thankfulness exists in our society. So how much appreciation do I have toward God through Christ and His gospel? How much appreciation do I have toward the people that have taught me the gospel? How much appreciation do I have toward my parents? I heard one, someone say one time, well, my parents were rotten. Well, they brought you into the world and gave you the opportunity to go to heaven that you wouldn't have had then brought you in the world. I don't care what kind of lives they live. Or are living. It's a matter of, like the old song says sometimes, count your many blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God hath done. One of the things that handicaps us in the lesson's yours. We don't take time to do a lot of things. We're too busy with things that are all going to burn up at the end of time. It's all going to pass away. We're too busy with things of the kingdoms of this world rather than the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which will abide. Face it, folks, the United States of America is going to fall. Just like every other nation has fallen. It may not fall and collapse overnight. It's, it's going to go down. And if it doesn't, when the Lord comes back, you're going to stand before him and say, I was a good American citizen. And that's going to get you into heaven. It's all according to the grace and mercy of God extended to us through Jesus Christ and his gospel. And we're all in need of crying out, Lord, have mercy on us. Because we need the forgiveness of our sins. And He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. His gospel is the power of God and salvation, Romans 1, 16. And we must do our best to preach it and to live it and defend it in every area of life. If you're not a Christian, we beg of you to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in Him to be the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Galatians 3, 27 and Acts 2, 38. Now to my brethren, are you appreciative for what you have? In your own home, your wife, your husband, your children, your job. That's all material, the house you're in. But are you appreciative of the blood-bought institution, the church, your brethren in the Lord? Are you appreciative of them? Do you love them? And some of us have to say, I don't love some of you. And you know most of the time why that's the case? You don't let me do what I want to do when I want to do. And what does that say? To make it rhyme about you. No wonder there's so much said by the apostle of love, John. Little children love one another. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? You are if you're not a Christian. And if you're in sin and haven't repented of it. So will you respond to Jesus' call as we offer that invitation now? is together we stand and sing.